الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبرز الزوج والله ان ميد الصلاه والسلام والله يقول الصلاه صلى الله عليه وسلم الموضوع الحاضر ما اسباب انقطاع الفعل المندوبات The topic of our lecture this evening is the reasons why we leave off optional and recommended deeds and the ways in which we can preserve those good deeds that we perform. There was once a man who was a da'i, a person who called to Allah. And he traveled with a group of people to the United States in order to give da'a. And he heard about a friend of his who he had known for a very long time and for many years. He heard that he was also in the U.S. but in a different city. And that all the time this man, his friend, had become distant from Allah. And that he's a person who commits some of the major sins. And this was someone who was close to him, he was a dear friend. So he said, or he thought to himself, that I will travel to see my friend, I will try to call him, bring him back to Allah. So some of the people who had traveled with him, they were a part of his group, they said that we want to come with you as well. And he said to them, no, let me go on my own and speak to him privately. Because maybe he won't be happy if he sees all of you come together. So he traveled to the other city. And he went to his apartment and he knocked on the door. And his friend greeted him. And he welcomed him. And he also had a, a group of friends around at that time. And they were also people who were drinking alcohol and, and uh, messing around with girls and women. So this man, he sat with, his, with these people and he began to call them, remind them of Allah. At night time, his friend gave him a room where he could stay and spend the night. So this man who had traveled to see his friend, he went to the room and he was getting ready for bed. Before he could realize there was a beautiful woman who was dressed in her nightwear and she was entering into the same room and they locked the door upon the two of them. And he tried to get out of the room, he knocked on the door, tried to leave, but he couldn't get out. And this woman, for the whole night, she was busy trying to um, seduce him the whole night. Until he succumbed to his desires and he, uh, and he slept with her. So he too had committed the sin. And then he was too embarrassed and too shy that he should go back to his friends that he left in the other city. So he instead remained with those group of people. And then he also partook and joined in with their activities. So he too would commit these major sins and drink alcohol and so on. So his friends that he had left behind in the original city, they wondered where he had got to. Because a day passed and then a week passed by and then a month passed by and he hadn't returned to them. And they don't know his address, they don't know where he went. And they don't know where their companion has gone. So they began to ask around and inquire and after a number of months they found the address that he had gone and traveled to. 
So a group of those people, they were to see the friend. And they realized that he had rented his own apartment in that city. So they knocked on the door. And he opened the door. And they entered. And he had with him a woman and he had alcohol with him. So when he saw them, he was surprised, shocked. And he went and he grabbed on to them. And he began to cry. And he said to them, save me from what I'm in. And save me from this, this danger that I'm in. And he began to cry. He said that I've left praying and I've left everything. <coughs> the first reason why people leave off doing good deeds is because of the company that they keep. And as, as is mentioned in the hadith or in the narration, that a person is upon the region of their best friend. And that's where they said that your companion makes your company them. And that is why our Prophet said in what is collected by Imam al-Bukhari, the example of a good companion or a good friend and an evil friend, it is like the example of the one who sells perfumes and the one who is an iron monger. And as for the one who is a righteous companion, this person who sells perfume, at the very least you find from him a pleasant scent. Or he will give you more than this and he will give you some perfume. As for the one who blows his bellows with iron, he will burn your clothing. Or you will take from him a foul odor. That is why the Prophet ﷺ informed us of that individual who killed 99 people. So he passed by a man who was known for his worship. And he said to him that I killed, murdered 99 men. And I want to repent and turn to Allah. So is there a way for me? He said no. So he killed him two and made it a hundred. And then he continued. And he passed by a scholar. And he said to him that I have killed, murdered a hundred people, can I repent? And the scholar replied, yes, you can repent. Who can stop you from repenting? So he asked him, so what do I do? He said to him that you must leave this land that you live in and go to a place where the people are good and the people are righteous. You have to change the company that you keep. Because it is your environment and the company that you keep that also impacts you. And that's why the Prophet said in the hadith in Bukhari, three things if you find them you will taste with them the sweetness of faith. That Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to you than anything else. And that you love someone only for the sake of Allah. And this is this point, the second point is what we're speaking about. Meaning that you love them for the sake of Allah, so they help you and you help them. And the third one was that you dislike to return to disbelief after Iman just as you dislike to be thrown into the fire. So this is the first reason. It is the company that you keep, whether it is good or whether it is bad. It is the cause for you either continuing in your good deeds or for you cutting off from those 
The second reason which allows you and helps you to continue to worship Allah it is for you to become aware and recognize the reward that is on offer for those deeds. Abdullah ibn Umar he knew that praying the janazah prayer and following the funeral procession was something which was rewarding. So one day, he heard Abu Huraira narrating from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as is in Sahih al-Bukhari whosoever witnesses the janazah and he prays upon that janazah then you will have the reward of a qiraf. And whoever stays with that procession until it is buried, he will have two qirafs. So Abu Huraira was asked, what does that word qiraf, what does it mean? He said, it is like two, a single qiraf is like a big mountain. And any narration like the size of the mountain of Uhud. So Abdullah ibn Umar was carrying pebbles at the time and he threw them down. He said, we have missed many mountains of good deeds. So when you when you are aware and you come to know the great reward that is an offer for those good deeds, it helps you to continue to perform them. When you prolong your record in prayer and your sajda, isn't there a reward in this? She was asking you. What is, how, how do we measure that reward? What is the reward? Good feeling. Good feeling. In the heart. Sorry? Is that a good feeling? Is there a specific like, specific reward from a hadith that is mentioned? النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يقول في حديث محمد بن رواه محمد بن مصعب بن عمر أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال عبد الله بن عمر الحديث سأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم سأل إن العبد إذا قام يصلي if a person stands and they pray أتي بذنوبه his sins are brought forth أتي بذنوبه كلها all of his sins are brought forth فوضعت على رأسه and then they are placed upon his head وعلى عاتقه and upon his shoulders so every time that person goes into ruku or into sajda, those sins they fall off him. So now you understand that the longer that you stay in those positions, the more time those sins have to fall off. And the longer that you stay in record, the longer those sins have to leave you. Doesn't that encourage you to prolong your report? So we all knew that making a record long was something good, but now that we know the exact reward, the precise reward, it is an encouragement to do it even more. So this in turn encourages you to continue to do those good deeds and not to stop. And if you didn't know, if you didn't know the exact reward, perhaps you make your report short and you get up and you don't really understand why you should prolong that report. The third reason, which helps you to preserve with them, it is for you to visualize the reward that is on offer. In this hadith that we just mentioned of Ibn Umar, 
ثم تبيعها حتى تدفن But the one who prays the janazah prayer and stays until it is buried will have the rewards of two qirats. And when he was asked to explain that word qirat, each one is like the mountain of Uhud. And so if you were to say mountain of Uhud, that sounds like it's good. But if you were to then visualize and understand what is the mountain of Uhud, and if one of you was to go to Medina, ثم خرج من باب الخلفي للمسجد النبوي. and then they exit the mosque, the prophet's mosque, which the Nabawi from its rear exit. فإنه يرى سلسلة جبال أمامه. you see a chain of mountains, a mountain range in front of you. على قدر نظره من من الش من ال من الشمال إلى اليمين سلسلة جبال. and that mountain range expands the whole horizon when you leave the masjid from that direction. هذه كل سلسلة الجبال هي جبال واحدة. All of that range of mountains, it is called the mountain of Uhud. So you would have double that reward. Each qirat is like what that mountain range. All of this is your reward. Just by praying on a janazah and waiting until that janazah is buried. So now you realize and you understand what it is that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to. So it's not just about you knowing the word mountain or that the reward is of a mountain. But it's about you visualizing that this is the extent and the scope of the mountain that is your good deeds. And that in turn encourages you to do good deeds and to continue doing them. خواني كنا في يوم الأيام في شاليه مطر على البحر. The sheikh said that he was one day on a chalet on the beach. أي في بيت مطر على البحر. وكان في الشتاء. And it was in the winter. فجلسنا في الخ في الخارج وأشعلنا الفحم وجلسنا شاي وحليب وقهوة. The chef said at 11 p.m. in the night, he and the people with him, they went out and they lit a fire and they were having some tea and they were they just sat by the fire. And it was in the winter. And then we began to speak about our relationship with Allah and about love, loving Allah. الشاليه وفي هذا المكان وبقربنا شاليهات كثيرة بعيدة هنا وبعيدة هناك. الشيخ said that he was in the chalet and it's like a whole line of chalets, people all around them. وشاليهات كثيرة بيوت كثيرة بيوت وكل ما نتحدث عن محبة الله عز وجل. and they're speaking about the love of Allah عز وجل. فجأة سمعنا أصوات الديك من بعيد. And from a very far distance away, they could hear the the roosters crowing. And when those birds that were closer, the roosters, they began to crow. And each as each each minute passes by, they hear birds that are closer and closer to them, making those similar sounds. إلى أن وصل إلى أن صاحت الديك التي عندنا. until the roosters and the chickens that were in their chalet they began to crow as well. وانق شعر وايت شعر الجلود. they said that our skin began to crow. لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال. because the prophet said صلى الله عليه وسلم. ما جلس قوم مجلسا يذكرون الله فيه. the group of people don't sit together to remember Allah. إلا Except that mercy envelops them. And tranquility descends upon them. And the angels come and surround them. And the Prophet ﷺ told us in another narration that when the rooster sees the angels, it begins to crow. So it's as if we could actually physically feel that the angels are coming closer and closer and closer until they were literally surrounding us. So now, when it happens live, it's something which takes place, you really appreciate the meaning of the hadith. 
في مثل هذه المجالس التي كلها ذكر حتى تحاط الملائكه فتشعر باحاطه الملائكه. And that it encourages you to continue attending these types of gatherings and to prolong them so that you can know that the angels are with you as well. إذا لم تستشعر بعد مع الأيام ستنسى وتنقطع ربما عن هذه الطاعة. And if you don't realize and you don't visualize the reward that is on offer, then perhaps after a few days you forget and you turn away from it. السبب هو الانقطاع عن الطاعة. The fourth reason why people leave off good deeds. التسويف أو سوف. It is. يقول سوف أفعل وسوف. Oh, it is this thing of doing things in the future. I will do. I'll get around to it. And then this delay leads to inevitably a person not doing anything. Ka'ab ibn Malik, the companion, was from amongst the early Muslims from the Ansar, the early people who became Muslim. And he was from amongst those companions who gave the pledge of allegiance at Bayat al-Aqaba. So when the Prophet ﷺ called the companions to go in the battle of Tabuk, Ka'ab ibn Malik was a companion who had attended all of the previous battles. But he kept saying to himself that tomorrow I'll get ready for the battle. And each day he would delay it until the following day. Until the day came that tomorrow would be the day that the army is actually leaving. But he said to himself, in the morning I'll get ready. So in the morning now the Prophet is getting weary and people, ready and people are starting to leave. So he said to himself, I still have time, I can get ready and I'll catch up later to them. And he kept, even on the same day, on that day of departure, he kept delaying it. And then that day passed by. He said, tomorrow I'll catch up with them, the books very far, I have lots of time. <laughs> Each day he kept delaying it until the next. Until days passed by. And now he realized that the Prophet is actually returning. And he realized that it was too late for him now to leave. The Prophet returned. And he wasn't from those people who participated. So the people who stayed behind, they came with their excuses to the Prophet And most of them being hypocrites, they came with false excuses. The Ka'b ibn Malik came. And he said, Oh, listen, Jalla Allah. He said, By Allah, I have... I have more, I am more eloquent to make an excuse than those people. He said, but I know that even if I lie to you, Allah knows that I am lying. <coughs> By Allah, I have no good excuse. <coughs> I had every, everything that allowed me to leave, I, I was prepared. <coughs> But I have no good excuse for not going. So the Prophet said, as for this one, he was truthful. So go back and let Allah judge in your affair. Days pass by. And Ka'b ibn Malik and his two other companions that were in a similar situation, the Prophet ﷺ told them to separate from their wives. And then none of the companions would speak to them, they wouldn't even give salams to them. And they would walk in the marketplace and no one would, would pay any attention to them. This is a man who was born and lived in Medina his whole life. And he was from the nobles of Medina. And no one would turn to him, no one would give him salam. Even when he would pass by the Prophet and give him salams, he was unsure did he respond or not respond. So it's as if Medina had become a strange city for him. 
So he said, I went and I climbed on the wall of my cousin's house, Abu Qadada. And he is from amongst the most beloved, closest people to me. And he is closely related to me by blood. And I know that he loves me and I love him. I climbed on the wall of his house and I gave him salams. But he never responded to me. He said, I asked him, I asked you by Allah, don't you know that I love Allah and his messenger? He didn't respond. So I asked him for a second time. He didn't respond. And the third time I asked him, I was crying. And he is from the nobility of Medina and he's crying. I ask you by Allah, don't you know that I love Allah and His Messenger? On the third time he responded, Allah and His Messenger know best. So he said that I left. And I was crying. Fifty nights like this passed by until Allah revealed verses in the Quran about their repentance. What is the reason of all of this? Because he kept delaying and saying that I will do something the next day. So one of the reasons why we leave off good deeds because we constantly delay them. Perhaps it is your habit that when you pray the obligatory prayer, you pray with it the sunnah prayers as well. But one day perhaps you're tired and you're like, okay, when I go home, I'll pray my sunnah prayers. I'm too tired. <coughs> now that you're in the mosque, you're in the place of prayer and you just finished the prayer, you're feeling lazy and you don't pray, so how about when you go home? And you're tired. So therefore, never do anything. Sometimes the Imam, he calls his community and he asks you to give sadaq and charity to a project. So Shaitan comes to you and he says, don't, don't give it right now, don't spend right now. Just in case someone says that you're showing off, why don't you instead go home and you get more money together and then you donate on your own, come alone in private secret, no one knows and you give that money. So now you're sitting in the masjid and the imam is speaking and you're motivated. But when you go home, you start to think over it again. And now what the Imam had said to, to motivate you, you've forgotten. And that money in your mind that you were going to give in charity, now you found other uses for it. You need to buy something, you need to get something. And so Shaitan often encourages us to delay. And that's why some of the Salaf used to say, beware of saying that you will do something in the future because it is from the, the soldiers of Shaitan. <coughs> the fifth reason why we leave off good deeds it is because of our sins. Whether they are major sins or minor sins. One of the Salaf said, and this was a scholar who had memorized the Quran. He said that one day I was walking and, and a woman passed by and I began to look at her, stare at her and look at her until she entered into her home. So one of the one of the people known for his worship and his piety passed by. And he came to me whilst I was staring at this woman and he can see that I'm staring. 
He said that you will find the result of this sin even if it is after a while. He said that I ignore it. <coughs> Nor did I make Tawbah for this. He said after 40 years I forgot the Quran. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal says Any calamity which befalls you is because of what your own hands earned And Allah says Rather, rather it is because of what they used to do that their hearts have become covered And the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Beware of belittling uh, sins. For the example of these sins is like a group of people who came to the bottom of a valley and each one came with a twig and a branch in order to create a fire until they came together with one of their twigs and branches and they placed it together. And then with that fire they would make their bread. And indeed these sins that we belittle, each time a person is held to account for them, it will destroy them. So each twig by itself is small, but together they create a big fire. A small sin here and a small sin there, but together they destroy a person. And that's why the scholar of the Tabi'in of Bahak said, We don't know of anyone who memorized the Quran and then forgot the Quran except because of the sin they committed. And a man came to Al Hassan al Basri and he said, Oh, Sa'id. I prepare myself to stand at night in prayer and I have my water ready for wudu but then I never end up praying I never end up waking up so Hassan al-Basri said it is your sins that have changed you so therefore don't belittle these sins because it is these sins that weigh down your heart and they stop you and prevent you from doing good deeds. One of the righteous people said, I used to pray Qiyam al-Layl. And then for five months I was unable to pray. It is because of a single sin that I committed. What was the sin? I saw a man crying. I saw a man reading the Quran and he was crying. So I said, this man's probably showing off. He said that I found then for five months because of this I was unable to pray. And that's why one of the things that we can do to remove this is to make a lot of istighfar. And the Prophet ﷺ will often make istighfar. And each sitting and gathering that he would have, he would seek Allah's forgiveness a hundred times. And it only takes a minute or so. You say, Oh Allah, forgive me, Oh Allah, forgive me, Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. <coughs> and 70 times he would repent to Allah. Oh Allah, accept my repentance. Oh Allah, accept my repentance. It only takes a minute or so. But it expiates all of those sins. And that is why Nuh said, Seek forgiveness from your Lord for he is often forgiving. He will send to you the rain from the skies. And he will give to your children and he will give to you wealth. And he will give to you gardens and rivers. Why do you not humbly return back to Allah? So, Seeking Allah's forgiveness makes you honor and respect and glorify Allah. The seventh reason which makes you stop performing these good deeds is 
It is because you are amazed or you think that you don't need these good deeds anymore. You don't feel that you need more good deeds because you think that you have enough. And that's why the Prophet told us about an individual who will come on the Day of Judgment. And Allah will say to him, Enter so and so into Jannah, into Paradise through my mercy. So he will say, this man will say, Oh Allah, through your mercy, but rather I want to be entered because of my deeds, my actions. So Allah, Allah will tell the angels to wait there. And then Allah will say, take his actions and weigh them for him. And then on the other side of the scale will be the blessing of eyesight that Allah gave to this man, just eyesight. And then his lifetime of actions is weighed with that blessing of eyesight. All of his good deeds on one side and just the blessing of eyesight on the other. And the blessing of eyesight will be heavier. And his lifetime of good deeds is lighter. So now he's already in the minus. And then it will be said, take him to the fire. Because even one blessing that Allah gave to him, he didn't do enough deeds just for that one blessing. So the man will scream. And he will say, oh my Lord, rather enter me into paradise through your mercy. So Allah will say, enter me into Jannah through my mercy. So be amazed by yourself, self-amazement, it is something which stops you from performing good deeds. And that's why the prophets of Allah would come before Allah as if they'd done no good deeds. Nuh <laughs> He is someone who spent 950 years calling his people to Allah. And he's calling them by day and by night. And in secret and in open. And all those people did was turn away from him. And, that, and he says, as Allah, as Allah mentions in the Quran, that every time I call to them so that you may forgive them, they place, they place their fingers in their ears so that they cannot hear. And they cover themselves with their clothing. And they continue and they're adamant and they're arrogant. And then I call them in the open. And I proclaim to them. And I speak to them in private and secret. But all they do is give birth to others who also disbelieve. And they advise one another to stay away from Nuh And 950 years they mock him and they make fun of him and they call him a false prophet. So Allah destroyed them all. <coughs> and also along with them the son of Nuh <coughs> After Allah took them all away. <coughs> and after 950 years of Nuh <coughs> giving da'wah by day and by night and and being patient with all of their harm, he asked and made a single request from Allah. He said, Oh Allah, my son is from my family. And your promise is true. And you are the most just of those who judge. And this is done with grateful etiquette. He simply wants his son to be saved from the flood. He is interceding for his own son. And he doesn't even ask Allah at white. But rather with etiquette and with respect, he is asking Allah. Oh Allah, my son is from my family. And your promise is true. And you are the most wise and just of those who judge.
So Allah Azza wa Jalla rebuked him and responded. Yeah, no. Oh no. No, he's not from your family. Because his deeds are not righteous. So don't ask me about that which you have no knowledge of. I warn you lest that you may become from the ignorant. So did he say, Oh Allah, 950 years I call to you and you don't even give me one thing? Rather instead he fell in prostration. And he said, Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that I should speak with that knowledge. Meaning that I repent and seek forgiveness from such a request. And if you don't forgive me and have mercy upon me, I will be from the losers. Because he glorified Allah. It's not something that he thought that his actions were great and many. And that is when Allah said to him, O Noah, land with safety and tranquility. And there will be blessings upon you. And upon those who have joined you. And there are other nations that will come that we will give them joy. And then they will take from us a painful taunt. The Prophet Yunus when he was swallowed by the whale, what did he say? Did he say that, oh Allah, I was someone who called people day and night, I spent my life, dedicated my life to you, and now you swallow, this whale swallows me? Or rather, he said with full humility and servitude before Allah, He said, None has the right to be worshipped except you. Glory be to you. I am from those who have wronged myself. And Allah responded to him. And he saved him from his pride. And that is how Allah saves the believer. So turn to Allah in poverty and need. Not in self-amazement and thinking that you have done more than you and so you deserve something. <coughs> From the reasons why we stopped in good deeds. It is because we don't realize how many evil deeds we have committed. We think that we have very few bad deeds. But then we will be shocked on the day of judgment when those evil deeds are many in number. And these are sins that we committed and we don't, didn't pay any attention to them and we never sought Allah's forgiveness for them. And they will see before Allah that which they never imagined. <coughs> and also from the reasons why we, we, we stopped doing good deeds. It is because of the many, the business, the many jobs that we have. It's because we have so many responsibilities, so many jobs and chores that we forget about good deeds. So how do we deal with this? So that we can continue our good deeds. Make a plan. And from this plan, you break it down into small parts and segments. And don't start with a big, difficult job. Or rather start with something which is small and easy to do. Have someone after Ramadan. Someone says after Ramadan, every night after Ramadan, I'm going to pray at least two hours every night. Because this, this person in Ramadan was praying during the night. So after the first, after Ramadan, the first night he stands for two hours. And the second night, two hours. And the third night, two hours. Fourth night, maybe ten minutes. And the fifth night doesn't even stand. 
And then for the rest of the year, it isn't prayer at all. He said that he, the chef said, I know someone who was a young man, he used to memorize from the and he is a friend of his. And he was someone who was uh, serious in his study. He said that I met him afterwards, five years later. And I asked him, tell me how you, how you finish memorizing the Quran. And he lowered his head. He said, it's been a year and a half and I haven't read the Quran. Because I became fed up. The Quran, the Quran, I don't read except in Salah. A year and a half and he hasn't recited the Quran. Because he felt it was too much. And that is why the Prophet advised us. Take from the actions that which you can cope with. Because Allah does not become fed up until you become fed up. And he said that the most beloved deeds to Allah are those which are continuous even if they are small. So therefore plan your good deeds. So if after Ramadan you want to stand in the night for prayer, and even though before Ramadan you never used to pray during the night, so then every night just stand for no more than five minutes, not an hour or two, just five minutes. And do that for the whole year until the next Ramadan. And once you do that for a whole year, then after the following Ramadan, then you increase it to 10 minutes a night. And each, each and every year, you increase it by a few minutes. So that you can test yourself and know that it's something you can continuously do. Likewise, after Ramadan, when it comes to fasting, don't be trying to be like Dawood Islam. You fast one day and you break one day and you fast one day. Don't say, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. Because you know that you won't be able to keep it up. And that is why Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, his father came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Oh, listen, Jabba Allah, I married my son to the noblest of people in, amongst the Arabs. And then when I asked his wife regarding him, she said that Abdullah, your son is a good man. He fasts during the day and he prays during the night. <coughs> what does that mean? means that he never comes close to her because he's fasting all the time and praying all the time. So the Prophet said, call Abdullah the son. And he said, oh Abdullah, I have heard that you fast every day and you spend every night in prayer. He said, yes. Yeah, and he would finish in his night prayer the Quran, all of the Quran, every night. So the Prophet said to him, don't finish the Quran in more than once a month. Meaning every day you read one juz. He said, oh, listen, Jawa, I can do more. He said, then finish every 20 days. He said, I can do more. He said, every 15 days then. He said, I can do more. He said, every 10 days then. He said, I can do more. He said that every week. And he said, in narration, that whoever finishes the Quran more than once every three days, they haven't understood anything from it. And then he said to him, fast in a month only three days. Because each good deed is multiplied by ten. So it's as if you fasted the whole month anyway. He said, I can do more. He 
And so likewise, the Prophet kept increasing gradually for him his fasting. They kept saying, I can do more. So then he said to him, that fast the fast of the world, he would fast a day and miss a day. He said, I can do more than this. He said, there is no more to this. And after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he became an elderly man himself. He felt that it was difficult for him to keep this up. And it was difficult for him to fast and to pray the way that he used to in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And he began to say, if only I had taken the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. So therefore, don't make spend all of your energy at once. So if you're a person who wasn't used to fasting outside of Ramadan, they fast only one day a month. And after that, in the following year, after the following Ramadan, two days a month. And in the third year, three days a month. And then add Mondays to that. And take it stage by stage. So when you have many actions that you need to perform, plan for them and spread them out. And also divide them. Don't do everything all at once in a single day. Or rather specify a day for this and a day for that. And then you are able to perform your good deeds. And perhaps once a month you can gather all of these deeds into a single day. The Prophet in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, he asked two from the monks this morning woke up fasting and Abu Bakr said, I did. And who today fed a poor person Abu Bakr said, I did. And who from amongst you visited a sick person today? Abu Bakr said, I did. And who followed the funeral procession? Abu Bakr said, I did. Because Abu Bakr was a man of good deeds. And he was from the truthful ones. The Prophet said, These four things don't gather in a single person on a single day except that they enter into paradise. So do this even if it is only once a month. And it will be written from amongst the people of Jannah. So all of these different chores and different jobs, plan for them and spread them out and make them into smaller things. If every one of us was to read a book, if you were to only read two pages a day, you would finish two books because each book, if each book was 365 pages, two books. And if you were to read a book in Sira, maybe you read five pages a day. And five times 365, it is a lot of pages. It is 18, 1900 pages. How many volumes is that? That's like five, six volumes of, of book. Who from amongst us has managed to read five volumes of anything? Even if it's before you go to bed, 15, 20 minutes, you read a few pages. You will be able to read a lot over time. But you have to divide this into manageable segments. So when you become too busy and there's too much to do, that's when you stop doing everything. Or rather, make them into things which are small and manageable. And then you will be continuous.
The Sheikh said the final point is that once a year, perhaps in the month of Ramadan, you have a time and a place where you where you assess yourself. And some people do this on a weekly basis. And they put down their good deeds, they write them down on a weekly basis that they want to do. And every week they go back and they assess themselves what have they achieved. Did I read those two pages that I wanted to read every day? Did I, read, did I pray those five minutes of the whole day that I wanted to do? Did I fast that one day in every month? It is self-accounting. And when you realize that you've fallen short, you then know that you need to change your attitude and you need to continue. And also don't forget to make dua to Allah. The Prophet taught us to say, Oh Allah, help me with your remembrance and your gratitude and to worship you in a good way. And that we make this dua every single prayer before we make the salams. And the Prophet said, oh Allah, I ask you, to perform good deeds. So that Allah helps you to perform those deeds. And the Prophet for this reason he taught Ali and his daughter Fatima that they should help themselves have the strength to perform these good deeds. <coughs> That before they go to sleep, they should say Subhanallah 33 times. And say Alhamdulillah 33 times. And Allah 34 times. Because all of this dhikr helps you to gain that strength that you need. These adhkar and this remembrance of Allah helps you to have the strength and the energy to worship Allah more. ولا ننسى اخواني كذلك ان نستعين بالاخوه كما علمنا بمصاحبه الاخوه حتى يعينوك على ان تفطر جماعيا وعلى ان تستمر في حفظ القران في حفظ الدروس الى اخره. And likewise we need to surround ourselves with good people and good friends and companions who encourage us and they help us to perform those good deeds. And all praises due to Allah.